Yeah. Yesterday we asked a bunch of questions on the Gemara and we said we'd hope to address them today. Yeah. Uh, the Gemara essentially said that at least the, the simple reading from Rashi is that Moshe wants his mistake of hitting the rock rather than speaking to the rock publicized because that is what prevented him from going to the land of Israel. Whereas what prevented the rest of the Jewish people from going to Israel is the fact that they didn't believe in their faith that Hashem could take them into Israel. And therefore Moshe wanted his, his uh, mistake published so that no one think that he suffered from the same issue that the Jews did. This is where it actually frames the Gemara. Yeah, and we brought the example of two women. One woman who was in uh, infidelity, another one who ate unripened fruit of the seventh year, which is permissible to eat freely only after it's ripe, but before it's ripe, it's considered destruction and that's forbidden. And uh, both of them are getting lashes. Um, but the one who only ate like a minor sin, as it were, you know, Ate, uh, ate something that would have been would have been kosher a month from now or would have been kosher in two months from now, but ate it early. She wanted that to be publicized and they hung it around her neck. The, 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 they hung her the, these dates around her neck so that everybody knows her mistake is not the same as her mistake. Like Mike Shabena wanted that his mistake should be distinguishable from the mistake the Jews made. This is where Rashi explains the Gemara. We asked a number of questions. Why this example specifically, why the example of Shvius um, by the example of two women. And um, which got into a broader discussion of what's the nature of this mistake of Moshe Rabbeinu, of hitting the rock rather than talking to the rock. And the notion that even though Moshe did not listen to what Hashem said, the miracle of the rock, the water coming out still happened. And they uh, said that we'll suggest something today. Anyway, as I was thinking about it, I realized that there's another big question here. It almost seems so obvious. I'm wondering why it's not more commonly discussed. Like the Marshal addresses a certain question, which perhaps we'll address later, which, but I think a big question is, we just finished saying, the Gemara right before this Gemara, we just finished saying that Moshe Ben is the defender of the Jewish people. And he told God to forgive the Jews for making a golden calf because you Hashem gave him all this gold. And what do you expect from them? You gave them all this gold and you sat them at the, uh, you know, the, the example of the child who is seated with all that money and good looking right in front of a house of ill repute, this sort of <laughs> phraseology, and you expect them to behave. So we're going, we're going, we're coming from a statement of the Gemara where Moshe is the great defender of the Jewish people and defending them from the worst sin, a gold, uh, golden calf. And two seconds later, the very next Gemara is Moshe being the exact, the exact opposite. Not, not only is he not defending the Jewish people for their mistake, but he announces and says, no, their mistake is not my mistake. Doesn't it seem at odds with the Gemara we just finished saying? It seems uncharacteristic. Moshe Rabbeinu should be defending the Jewish people. And between the two sins, not trusting Hashem to go to Eretz Yisrael versus, versus golden calf, you would think the golden calf is worse. So what happened to Moshe, the great defender? Of course. So what happened to Moshe, the great defender? I, that, I, as I was thinking about this Gemara, it hit me and it hit me. I, what happened here? And that kind of, that question is uh, what pushed me to think of the Gemara in a different way. As follows. So the, the examples of two women, right? One who was unfaithful and one who only ate those unripened fruits that she wasn't supposed to eat. And she should have waited a few months until the fruit was ripe from that seventh year, the sabbatical year, right? The law of the sabbatical year is that the food has to be left to grow freely and only to be eaten freely and openly by anybody who wants to eat. And eating it before it's ripened is considered a destruction rather than eating and therefore forbidden. So it's like this minor kind of sin. Yeah, why we choose this one? Why this one? So now the question is, this is the Marshal who addresses this, is who are the two people in the in analogy? Right, there's one analogy is the, the woman who was unfaithful versus the woman who ate these unripened fruits. So who is who? So Rashi says that Moshe Rabbeinu is the one who ate the unripened fruit. 
and the rest of the Jewish people are the one who were unfaithful because they um, they wanted to they had, didn't have faith that Hashem was going to land it, that Hashem could take him to the land of Israel that's like being unfaithful whereas Moshe Rabbeinu only hit the rock instead of talking to the rock and that's like eating the uh, unripened fruit but the Marsha points out that when the Gemara introduces this analogy the Gemara says to what can be compared to Moshe and David and then it goes on to give the analogy whereas in Rashi's analogy David's not part of the picture and if the Marshal kind of, it seems like he's reading it into Rashi itself, although it's kind of difficult, but he basically says that David is like that woman who is unfaithful. And if we ask, don't tell anybody what I did. Whereas Moshe is the one who ate the, these unripened fruits and says, tell everybody what I did. So no one thinks I'm the same as the Jewish people, as the rest of the Jews. Right? Others, however, because of Rashi's interpretation, which leaves David out of the analogy, actually remove that statement from, remove the word David from the intro. Instead of saying, how, what can we compare Moshe and David? They read the Gemara as, so what can be compared Moshe? Without saying the word David, because in the, in the analog, David's not there. It's just a question of Moshe versus the other Jews, not David. And they take that word out. All to say that there's a, I'm taking the liberties of wiggle room to understand who, are, who is who in the analogy. And if I might suggest as follows. Perhaps as follows. The two women, the woman who is unfaithful and the one who ate um, the, little bit of, the little fruits, are both referring to the Jewish people in the desert. And the, and the uh, woman who's unfaithful, that's a reference to the Jews who worship the golden calf. It's unfaithful. Instead of being one with Hashem, you're one with a foreign, a foreign God. And they already got the defense earlier. When Moshe Rabbeinu told Hashem, you gave them gold. But then there's the other woman. There's the woman who, the other woman or the, the Jews later on in the desert, some 40 years later actually, who didn't want to go into the land of Israel. It's another mistake. And considering they made another mistake, Moshe Rabbeinu says, publicize my, my mistake because my mistake is going to defend them. How so? How is Moshe Rabbeinu's mistake of hitting the rock rather than talking to the rock going to defend the Jews who didn't want to go into the land of Israel? Sorry? That's correct. Sorry? No, I understand, I understand that. I understand. No, no, you're right. No, it's, you're right. You're right. When Moshe hit the rock, it was the other people, but it doesn't, he's still defending his previous generation as to point to the fact of the Medrash that Noah quoted yesterday, in which the Medrash says, even though the verse says that the reason why Moshe Rabbeinu didn't go into the land of Israel is because he hit the rock, nonetheless, the Medrash says, in a deeper truth, Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to stay in the desert because if his people aren't going into Israel, the generation that died earlier, he doesn't even want to go into Israel, which means in his act that happens after the death of his nation, of his people, he's still defending his people. Who died earlier. And the question is how? So perhaps, sorry? He defended his people for the 40 years. And then at the end, he throws them under the bus. God forbid, right? Yeah. He did. Yep, that's right. That's a good point, yeah. But I'm suggesting that Moshe actually in that act and in publicizing his mistake with the rock is actually defending them. He's actually defending them. So I'm, no, I, 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 I've already prefaced that this is a, there's other ways of interpreting. I understand that. This, I understand that. I'm just, I'm just offering a different explanation. I understand. I understand, and I'm just, I'm just uh, giving another, another reading, another reading. Sorry. Hundred percent. I and yet Moshe Rabbeinu and, Mo, and yet Moshe Rabbeinu is still is the, the main reason why I'm going with this interpretation as mentioned before is because this Gemara comes right after the Gemara before describing Moshe as the defender. And one second, one second, one second. Offering a different explanation. I understand that there's other ways. I'm just prefacing. Would do my legal duties to say that there's other ways of reading the Gemara, but this is one, or a suggested one. Another thing, also the Gemara introduces this analogy by saying that there were two sustainers of Israel. 
Whereas in the, whereas the end, the Gemara goes on to talk about places where they fail the Jewish people, not defenders, not, not providers. No, they're not providing. He's actually saying, disregarding, saying, don't, conclu- don't confuse their mistake with my mistake. In Rashi's reading, Moshe is not acting as a provider here. He's acting as a distancer. Don't confuse their mistake with my mistake. I understand, but it's a, it's an, it's an, it's a strange way of introducing it. Anyway, so let's, let's, let's see how the Gemara, let's see perhaps another suggestion, another way of reading it. So again, I'm going to suggest that in the act or in the publishing, publishizing of the mistake that he made and hitting the rock rather than talking to the rock, that in and of itself, that publication is a defense of the Jews who didn't want to go into the land of Israel. How so? So Hasidus explains the, the spiritual dimension of the mistake of those who want to stay in the desert rather than going to the land of Israel. And the spiritual dimension explanation is as follows. The desert represents an, a, spiritual, a spiritual oasis. They were detached from the realities of our world. They didn't have to farm, didn't have to raise cattle. And all they had to do is just bask in the clouds of glory and God's glory, eat free food, uh, have, have no troubles or anything. All they had to do is essentially study Torah. And they got spoiled, as it were. They got spoiled in that, in that, uh, in that cocoon. And they didn't want to leave it and go to the land of Israel and start working the field, engaging in war and, and fighting nations and commerce and politics and business. Not interested. So they, this is the way Chassid explains that they wanted to stay in the land of Israel. So it was spiritual. Sorry. I've already made my legal duties. Let me, let, let's finish, please, if you don't mind. And even on the Pshat level, Chassid explains how this works in, but it's not for now. The bottom, even in the Pshat level, you talked about before with the man, that the Jews were spoiled, even on the Pshat level. And this is a spiritual spoiled. That's what this is. It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual being spoiled, which in already itself, you can see, is similar to the previous defense that Moshe Rabbeinu gave. When Moshe Rabbeinu says, you gave them gold and silver, how could they not fail? Right? So similar thing here. You gave them such a spiritual bubble, why would they want to leave? Why would they want to leave? then they would want to go in. But it's the reverse. They're going from a place of relaxation into a place of struggle, right? So that's correct. And that's what... One second. Good morning, Judge. Just going to put you on mute so you can continue. Okay, so now the question becomes, how does, how does hitting the rock fit in here and how does this, this sabbatical year fit in here? So perhaps something like this. The, the sabbatical year, the sabbatical year also represents a spiritual oasis, a detachment from engagement in this world, right? And in that regard, in that regard, the world is not the friend, but the enemy, right? On Shabbos, as it were, when we transcend the world around us, the world is an other, is an other thing that we leave alone. The rest of the week, we're like in the land of Israel where we have to work, we have to work the field, and the world is the medium through which we connect Hashem. Whereas on Shabbos, or slash desert, we, our service to Hashem is to detach from the world around us. And then eating from the fruit before it's time for Shabbos is like, is like, uh, is, is, is a kind of way of saying that we don't like this place where we're not in Shabbos. We don't want to be engaging in the world. We'd rather be in the Shabbos place. We want it to always be Shabbos so I can eat whenever I want because it's all Shabbos. Whereas the, whereas the Torah says, no, that's destruction. It's destruction if you're Shabbos all the time. Because there are times when you have to engage in the world. There are times when you have to go to Israel and work hard in the land. You can't just stay in the desert and in Shabbos mode all your life. It's not the way it is. Sorry? That's right. That's the fence. It's like, it's like, a, it's, like a rich family brings up a child. Correct. And Shabbos doesn't have any 
Exactly. So it's exactly in line with the previous Gemara. The previous Gemara of Moshe Rabbeinu is defending the Jewish people by saying you, you physically spoiled them and that's why they did a golden calf. Yeah. Now the Gemara is saying you spiritually spoiled and that's why they didn't want to go to the land of Israel. It's a, it, there's a symmetry here. Now what does it, what does it have to do with hitting the rock? What, what's the difference between hitting the rock and talking to the rock? What is the difference? And why is it at the beginning of the 40 years God tells them, hit the rock. Later God tells them, speak to the rock. But instead he hits the rock. What's the difference between hitting and talking? So perhaps something as follows. The rock, right, is, is, is like a shell. You don't see what's in it. But buried inside of it, there's water, there's life. Our physical world is a shell, conceals godliness. Buried in the physical world, there is water, there is godliness, there's life. And our mission is to reveal that water, to reveal the water from the rock, to reveal godliness in the shell of this world. That's our job. But when you're in a Shabbos mode, and you think the world is a distant, far off thing, then your engagement with the world is strike. Because you're distant from it. It's the enemy. You don't talk to it. You don't have a communication with the world on Shabbos. It's something you strike. And it's something that's away from you. Something at a distance. Which is why at the beginning of the 40 years, perhaps, where Hashem says, okay, you're at the beginning of your journey. So I'm taking you in to be my people. I'm making you one with me. And the fact that you have, that you're, you know, I'm taking you out of Egypt, I'm dragging you away from the, the worldly affairs. So at this point, it's uh, acceptable that you have to hit the rock. Because you're not at the point yet where you can have this kind of communication and, and uh, face-to-face engagement with the world because you haven't been spiritually fortified enough yet to do that. So you need to be in a Shabbos mode. But 40 years later, when the Baptist went to the land of Israel, Hashem says, now it's not time to hit the rock. Now it's time to talk to the rock. Now it's time to engage in the world on its level so you can talk to it and communicate to it and in that way reveal its goodness. Not revealing its goodness by being at a distance from it, hitting it, but being, uh, revealing the goodness in it by speaking to it, by speaking the world's language, by speaking the language of the rock itself, as it were. And then you'll re- reveal its goodness. But as we just read, the Jews were not ready. Moshe Rabbeinu's generation was not ready to do that. They wanted to stay in, in the in the desert, they want to stay in the spiritual cocoon. And therefore Moshe Rabbeinu says, like the Medrash says, if you guys are stuck in that place, I'm stuck in here with you. And that's the Pasuk, you didn't believe me, in other words, you guys weren't ready to go there, so I'm also here with you. Like that Medrash, that Moshe Rabbeinu stayed in the, died in the desert because the people uh, weren't, weren't ready to go into Eretz Yisrael. Seemingly that Medrash is a, is a direct contradiction to the simple verse. The simple meaning, the, the literal verse describes him not going to Israel because he hit the rock instead of talking to the rock. And here the Medrash saying a spiritual, a, a, a noble cause, he's not going into Israel because he's staying behind with his people. They seem to be at odds. No, I, I, there's, a Medrash, there's a Medrash that says actually Moshe Benu says it. There's a Medrash that says that Moshe Benu himself says it. Yeah? yeah. Now, in, in, even, even if it is Hashem. Right, so even, even if it's Hashem saying that, it's still, it's still a contradiction. It's not a punishment. It's not a punishment for a mistake he did. Even if he didn't make a mistake, stay behind because the people are there. So then do with the mistake then. But here we see that there is a connection between the two. Here we see a deeper that there is a connection because the mistake itself is Moshe Rabbeinu, as it were, lowering himself to their level. Lowering himself to their level. And therefore Moshe Rabbeinu says, publicize my mistake because in this way, you're gonna, I'm, this is how I'm going to defend the Jewish people even though I am ready to go into the land of Israel. I'm ready to go into the land of Israel. I'm ready to work for Hashem and engage with the world and do what it's supposed to. But my people aren't, so I had to hit the rock. I had no choice because you guys didn't believe me. You guys weren't ready for it. Right? That's what Moshe Benin says. You, weren't, you didn't believe me, and therefore I, had, I was, uh, the simple reading is that he was flustered, as it were, and therefore he hit the rock instead of talking to the rock. On a deeper level, it's not just that he's flustered, or maybe he's flustered by the fact that they aren't ready. You guys aren't ready to talk to the rock. You guys aren't ready to talk and engage with the world yet. Okay, so I'm going to hit the rock because this is where you're at. And because of that, you're stuck in this place. I'm also stuck in this place. And it all comes from the same defense he gave before. You, Hashem, spoiled them. Before he was defending them, you, spoiled, you, you physically spoiled them. And that's why they have gold and silver and they're making a golden calf. And now I'm defending you because you spiritually spoiled them. And that's why they don't want to go into the land of Israel and engage. Sorry? I understand that. As I mentioned before, it, 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 even after they died, he's still defending the previous generation. Yeah. And that's, what, that's, what, that's what exactly right. <clears throat> he's hitting the rock because, in fact, when he tells the Jewish people, 
Yan, Yan Kiloya Mantabi, who's, who's the you? Who's the you he's talking about there? He's talking to the people about the Eretz Yisrael, and he says, you didn't believe me. It wasn't them, it was the previous generation. He's talking to them about what he meant to the previous generation, right? So in his hitting the rock, he's talking about not them, but the previous people who didn't believe him. What's Moshe Rabbeinu speaking to the people? Yeah, it's the, it's, it's the speech when Moshe Rabbeinu speaks to the Jewish people, if I'm not mistaken. That verse that the Gemara quotes comes from Moshe Rabbeinu when 14, it's in, no, it's in Bamidbar, it's Hashem speaking. It's Hashem speaking. Right, that you didn't believe in me, right? But later when Moshe Rabbeinu says it, he blamed it on the Jews. He says, later when Moshe Rabbeinu repeats the story, he says, you guys didn't uh, trust me and that's why I had to do this. Anyway, it's a suggested explanation. Obviously, it's my own, and therefore, one can argue, agree, disagree. But I'm, I'm trying to, the, the, my, main, uh, my main driving f- factor is trying to be consistent in Moshe Rabbeinu being defended the Jewish people. Now, the Gemara, and Moshe Rabbeinu remains that way, even all the way to the end. Which also, perhaps, if we can, we can even connect to the Marsha. We said the Marsha said earlier that Moshe, that Dovod HaMelech, I'm sorry, David Melech was the one who said, don't publicize my, my mistake, because he's like the one, he's like the woman who, who was unfaithful. Right? And the Gemara introduces both this, this, this analogy by saying that David and Moshe were both providers of the Jewish people. So Moshe being the provider here, we see Moshe being is providing the defense by saying, if you guys aren't ready to go to Israel, you guys aren't ready to talk to the land, to talk to the rock, you guys aren't ready to engage with the world, then I'm going to stay here with you and hit the rock. Because that's where you are. That's where you are. Because you, Hashem, spoiled them spiritually. So but King David, sorry. See, even when Moshe Rabbeinu defends the Jewish people, he doesn't not tell them off. When Moshe Rabbeinu defended the Jewish people at, at the Golden Calf, he also told them off then too. But he still defended them, right? Just, they're not. In other words, that's what a good leader does. Tells his people when they're making a mistake. You guys are making a mistake by not going to the land of Israel. At the same time, I'm going to defend why it is you don't want to go into Israel, and I'm stuck here with you. Making, quote unquote, the same mistake, as it were, because this is where you're at. Yeah. And he wanted so badly to be part of Torah, and yet he was willing to risk being part of Torah just to defend the Jewish people. Right. So now comes to King David. Yeah. Now comes to King David. King David is the, is the one who, who was unfaithful and says, don't publish my miracle. Don't publish my mistake, I'm sorry. And this, no, no, the mistake of, the mistake of um, being with Bacheva. It's a questionable relationship. Legal, but not moral, as uh, you put it. So, perhaps, King David saying, don't publicize it because it doesn't provide any good for anybody else. It was my personal mistake. Right? The Gemara said earlier that a, pers- a, a personal mistake is between man and, and God, no one should publicize. So the, the personal mistake that Moshe, Moshe made a per- personal mistake here by hitting the rock instead of talking to the rock and nobody knew what Hashem told him. So what do I have to publicize it for? What do I have to publicize it for? So the simple reading of the Gemara is he publicized it so no one should think that he made the mistake, same mistake they did. Right, that's a simple reading. And the more, perhaps the deeper reading is I'm suggesting here is, Moshe Rabbeinu said, if publicizing my mistake is going to defend the Jewish people, then, don't, then do so. Right. And King David saying, my mistake is not going to help anybody else. Don't publicize it. What's the point? It's, you, it, it, it's between me and, you and me and you, God. It's not going to help anybody else. Nobody else here is at fault except for me. So what does anybody else have to know about what I did? But yet the verse goes and publicizes it. Why? Because Gemara famously says in Brachas, that um, David's mistake is what opens up the door for, for Baal Tshuva, for, for returnees, to tell everybody. King David made a mistake and he uh, did Tshuva. So can you. And therefore, as a part as, as a provider of Israel, as a provider of these people, it's important that your mistakes be publicized so everybody else knows that they can go through the same mistake and still return. So even though David is saying, I don't see any value in publicizing it because What's this going to help the Jewish people who I'm leading? There's no reason for it. Hashem says there is a reason. And therefore he does publicize it. Whereas Moshe Rabbeinu is, himself sees 
the reason to be to publicize it. He himself sees the value of publicizing the mistake so that he defends the Jewish people and puts himself in their position, as it were, and stays with them in the desert. And that's why he says, publish it. So this is a suggested reading of the Gemara. And again, it's only suggested, and there's many other ways of reading it. And uh, the floor is open to disagreement and other, and other interpretations.